Today, the mystery of the disappearing buffers. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, one that is post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Well, you may remember that the previous treasurer trumpeted on about the $250 billion of household savings, which we heard through 2020 and 2021. And indeed, Phil Lowe recently quoted a similar figure in one speech, although on the ABC 730, he seemed to lower it to $200 billion. Now, those buffers came from multiple sources, including JobKeeper, other government benefits, sanctioned withdrawal from super, and of course, direct household savings. But we also know that those same buffers are now being spent, and they're not equally spread across all households. And in fact, this buffers question is an important one, especially given the forecast for continued rising interest rates and the impact on the overall economy. In fact, in a recent RBA FOI, they discussed beefing up wording in an RBA Outlook report and they said consumption growth could also be weaker than expected, for instance, if asset prices were to decline or if the effects of higher inflation and interest rates weighed on discretionary spending by more than anticipated. This risk is most pronounced for households with relatively low savings buffers and high debt relative to income. And interestingly, in the FOI, Phil Lowe replied, when talking about uncertainties, I was a bit surprised there wasn't more about how households and businesses and asset markets might respond to higher interest rates. Well, we tend to agree with that. This has become actually a critical issue because, for example, the ANZ Bank yesterday dramatically lifted its forecast for Australia's official cash rate to 3.35% by November 2022. According to David Plank, who's the head of Australian economics, they said, our expectation is the RBA will deliver this via four more successive 50-point basis rate hikes in August, September, October and November. This 200 basis point of additional tightening would see the cash rate target at 3.35% by November. And of course, a cash rate of 3.35% would imply that household interest payments as a percentage of household income would rise dramatically. ANZ's forecast basically mirrors the futures market, which tips an official cash rate of 3.3% by December and a peak of 3.5% by March 2023. So if the ANZ's forecast did come to fruition, that would lift Australia's average variable discount mortgage rate to around 6.7% by November, whereas the futures market is forecasting perhaps a rate climb to 6.9% by March 2023. But either way, it's true to say that Australians will face more than a 3% lift in variable mortgage rates in only seven months, and that would be the biggest increase in the nation's history. And if you start adding principal debt repayments into the mix, which have risen significantly alongside Australia's house price boom, household debt repayments will soar well above their 2008 level, as shown by a recent CBA chart. Now, an OCR of 2.5% would lift average household debt repayments to around their 2008 peak, so the 3.35% as projected by ANZ would lift those debt repayments even higher. Now, consider the impact on the Australian economy because it means that extra household income would be sacrificed in mortgage repayments in addition to crashing house prices that would also crater household consumption spending, which of course is the economy's biggest driver. Indeed, a recent survey from Baron Joey Capital Partners showed that around 82% of Australian mortgage holders would cut back on consumption spending if mortgage rates climbed above 6%. And nor would Australian households' supposedly strong savings save the day. According to CBA, 36% of all borrowers have zero buffers and nearly 50% of borrowers have less than three months. And in fact, things look even tighter, according to Westpac, in their interim results for 2021 from May the 9th, 2022. While they said that 70% of households with a mortgage are ahead on their payments, once offsets are taken into account, by the way, that excludes equity and line of credit products, which do not have scheduled principal repayments. 
they also showed that less than half of all borrowers in Westpac are less than one month ahead on their mortgage repayments or behind even taking offsets into account. Australia's households therefore are extremely sensitive to increasing mortgage repayments arising from those RBA rate hikes and they will necessarily cut back heavily on consumption if mortgage rates lift too far. But then Michelle Bullock, the Deputy Governor at the Reserve Bank, just delivered a speech playing down the risks of aggressive rate hikes in mortgage land. Bullock said that only around one third of all households have housing debt, which is true. Moreover, many have squirreled away savings over the pandemic and made additional mortgage repayments. So she said the ratio of household credit to income is actually a fair bit lower than the headline figure and is around the same as it was back in 2007. Moreover, almost three quarters of debt outstanding is held by households in the top 40% of the income distribution. Nevertheless, just under 30% of borrowers would face relatively large repayment increases of more than 40% of their current payments if interest rates would arise by 300 basis points as predicted by financial markets. And she went on to say that the majority of currently owned outstanding fixed rate loans are in fact due to roll off within the next two years with the greatest concentration of loans due to expire in the second half of 2023. And if you assume that all fixed rate loans roll onto variable mortgage rates and new variable rates are broadly informed by current market pricing, estimates suggest that around half of fixed rate loans by number would face an increase in repayments of at least 40%. And in fact, data from Westpac on the fixed rate distribution shows precisely the same picture. Over the next year, it's going to be a problem. But there again, overall, Bullock concludes... There's nothing to see here with respect to impact of rate rises on households. I would conclude that as a whole, households are in a fairly good position. The sector as a whole has large liquidity buffers. Most households have substantial equity in their housing assets and lending standards in recent years have been more prudent and have built in larger buffers for interest rate increases. And much of the debt is held by high-income households who have the ability to service their debt and many borrowers are already making repayments well above what is required. Furthermore, those on very low fixed rates loans have some time to prepare themselves for higher interest rates. So that's all right. Then. No, it's not. Two points. The first is that she, of course, talks about all households, but does go on to concede that 30% only have a mortgage. Might be a bit higher than that, actually. But that more specific data from Westpac and CBA shows the distribution is the question. And you can't talk about averages, either by buffers or indeed about household loans and repayments. Which is why, when I look at my mortgage stress data, there's a very high proportion of households, around 45 or 46%, who are now close to the edge on making those mortgage repayments. And I look at it in cash flow terms, of course, as I've discussed in previous shows. So, unfortunately, I think the RBA is spinning a yarn here. Plus, of course, they also are using three-year-old data from Hilda. The most recent data from Hilda is, of course, very out of date because things have changed dramatically in recent times. And the rate at which rates are rising means that we have yet to see the full impact even of the May rate rise. So it's going to take some time before we see the true impact on household budgets. But if CBA and Westpark are reporting correctly on the distribution of people who have a big issue, and if it's true that all those fixed loans are going to reset, then we are in for a major crisis ahead. Now, you could argue that some of those talking about this are trying to persuade the RBA not to lift rates higher. That could well be true, because of course this has have a big impact on the bond market, for example. So it could be that some of those spruiking some of these numbers are trying to persuade the RBA not to break the bond market. Well, I don't have any such allegiance. But what I am concerned about is the fallout on real households at the moment. The chances are more households are going to cut back. We also know that 16% of households have already changed their shopping habits because of what's happened, and particularly going to cheaper shopping baskets or indeed going to cheaper stores. So this is a very important and significant issue. And I come back to my question. Where are these buffers? The buffers are not equally distributed across all households. Many of the buffers reside on households without debt 
and with assets, of course, that they already own. But those with a mortgage have a big problem. The rate of increase is very significant and will continue, and more households are going to get in difficulty. That's why the mortgage stress analysis that I do is so critical. And I will make this point again, that households should not rely on incomes suddenly expanding quickly. I don't think that's going to happen. In fact, incomes in real terms are going backwards quite fast. And secondly, households need to understand their household budgets. Only half budget, according to my surveys. So it would be good to go to the ASIC Money Smart website and get one of their tools there to manage your budget. And the third point, of course, is to talk to your lender if you are in difficulty and talk to them early because there are some things that they can do. Although extending your loan over a longer period or going interest only helps the banks because they will get more interest for longer, it doesn't necessarily affect the household. So the bottom line here is those buffers are a mythology. It is not actually equally spread across all households. There are many already doing it tough and more will follow as rates rise. Now, if you're buying your home in Sydney's contentious market, you don't need to stand alone. This is the time you need to have Edwin Almeida from Ribbon Property Consultant standing alongside you. Buying a property is both challenging and adversarial. The vendor has a professional on their side. Emotions run high. Price discovery and price transparency are hard to find. And then there's the wasted time and financial investments that you make. Edwin understands your needs, so why not engage a licensed professional to stand alongside you? With RPC, you know you have experience, knowledge and master negotiators looking after your best interests. So shoot Ribbon an email at info at ribbonproperty.com.au and if you use the promo code DFAWTW slash Martin, you can get a 10% discount offer. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.